Good morning, um, and um, it is a great pleasure to be here in this stunning venue in Athens, and my thanks to the Economic Chamber of Greece for inviting me to participate uh, today. So in my brief introductory remarks, I will focus on some select high-level issues relating to Ireland's experience in our own EU IMF programme, which we entered into in December 2010, and which was uh, completed in December 2013. And while the nature of the crisis that developed in Ireland was quite different from that in Greece, and the circumstances were not as severe, I hope that some of our experiences are relevant for your discussions during the course of today. Maybe at the outset, let me uh, note two aspects of the economy that did not change during or after the crisis. First, the crisis has not led us as an economy to change our overall economic model, which is an export-oriented, foreign direct investment-driven model, and which is one that served us well before, but also during and after the crisis. And second, Structural reforms were not actually a prominent feature of the Ireland Adjustment Programme, which largely reflects the fact that Ireland um, went into the programme with markets that were already relatively flexible uh, compared to European norms. Instead, Ireland's crisis, which broke in 2008 just after Lehman's, was caused by excessive lending to the property sector, this was financed in the main by unstable wholesale funding from abroad. That resulted in a massive property sector bubble with inflated residential and commercial property prices, very high private sector indebtedness, and over-reliance of the public finances on property sector revenues, and a large current account deficit. So when the crisis hit, the property and the construction sectors collapsed very quickly with significant spillover effects to the rest of the economy and to the public finances. And the massive exposure of our banking system to the inflated property sector became very evident very quickly towards end 2008. Iris banks were no longer able to fund themselves in international markets. They no longer had remaining collateral that was eligible for ECB monetary policy operations. And a range of government supports, it quickly became clear, would be necessary in order to support the banking sector and to maintain the supply of credit to the households and to businesses. So the rapidly widening fiscal deficit on the other combined with the commitment to backstop the large losses of the banking sector, on the other hand, pushed the government finances into an unsustainable position in the eyes of international investors and the need to enter an EU IMF program, which we did in December 2010. In fact, the process of macroeconomic and fiscal adjustment had started in late 2008, roughly two years before the Troika arrived, with, which was the start of what was a long series of austerity budgets. And indeed, much of the heavy lifting had already been achieved by the time the program started. There was strong political and public buy-in for this program from the outset. The fiscal adjustment program was also underpinned by a realistic set of macroeconomic and budgetary targets. And this enabled the government over the subsequent years to deliver on the targets that had been set at the beginning of the, of the program, to over deliver in most years. And establishing that track record of uh, delivery is generally considered to have been quite important in terms of the restoration of market confidence. I would say that the modalities of the program were also important. So the EU IMF loans that were offered to Ireland initially came with unfavorable terms, both in terms of the interest rates charged, also in terms of the maturities. And this constituted a threat to the sustainability of the Irish debt situation at that time. 
I think this was eventually recognized. From the middle of 2011, Ireland benefited from significant reductions in interest rates on official loans, from extensions of the maturities. And if you examine the market yields on Irish government debt, this alleviation of the financial terms of the assistance was a clear turning point in achieving the restoration of market confidence. And the, these improvements, combined with the adherence to the budgetary targets, also clear signs of a turnaround in the economic environment began to appear in around mid to end 2012. And that allowed the government to take the decision to exit the programme on schedule without a precautionary programme, but with a post-programme surveillance. Importantly also, our National Debt Management Agency had, con had accumulated a large cash reserve before we exited the programme, and there was also, as a result, no immediate exposure to market risk in the event of unforeseen events that were outside of our control, and that was quite important, I think. Let me say a very brief word about the banking system. Rebuilding the banking system in Ireland from the ashes of the financial crisis was probably the main challenge that we faced during this period. Some of the challenges undoubtedly remain, particularly the stock of non-performing loans, which is a problem for many economies. And the supports for the banking system, both before and during the adjustment programme, these included a government guarantee of liabilities, establishment of a bad bank for commercial speculative property loans, considerable downsizing through both deleveraging and also a restructuring of the Irish banking system, and most notably large-scale capital injections. And overall, the Irish government injected around 40% of GDP into the banks much of which has been subsequently retrieved. And in addition to the massive fiscal outlay, which was shared among taxpayers, there were also sizable losses incurred among bank shareholders. So as in the case of Greece, and indeed all the countries represented on the panel this morning, it is Irish households that ultimately, and in a variety of ways, bore the large share of the adjustment. Fiscal measures led to an increase in the effective tax rate for average households of around eight percentage points from 17% to 25%. Significant pay cuts were imposed on all public sector workers, while welfare payments were also reduced. Incidentally, income inequality did not actually change much in Ireland during this recession, mainly because of both the progressivity of public sector wage cuts and tax increases, but also the impact of automatic stabilizers and particularly unemployment benefits. And this really helped to ensure that social cohesion was maintained in Ireland throughout this period. In the private sector then, those firms that experienced a negative demand shock opted to reduce labour costs through a combination of uh, layoffs, wage cuts, hours reductions. And overall, the wage reductions, these measures, did not prevent a significant increase in unemployment. Unemployment in Ireland increased from 4% to 15% over a five-year period. But the internal devaluation that occurred did allow Ireland to regain significantly um, much or most of the competitiveness that had been eroded in the build-up to the crisis. And indeed, Ireland's openness as an economy has meant that strong export growth has contributed very significantly to the recovery in the overall economy. And in this way, Ireland has been fortunate to benefit more than other countries from the recovery in external demand and from some favourable exchange rate developments. So let me, in closing, let me uh, turn to recent performance. The Irish economy has recovered particularly strongly over the past six years. 
with a turnaround starting around 2012, around a year before the programme finished. Unemployment, which peaked at 15%, is currently running at around 6% and is still falling. Underlying economic growth is running at between 4 and 5% per annum, and this has been broad-based across almost all sectors and regions of the economy, and it is now being driven more by domestic demand rather than external demand. The general government balance has recorded primary surpluses in each of the past four years, and the public sector debt ratio is also following a favourable trend, although as a central banker we still think it is too high. So employment, income and wealth levels in Ireland, they're now roughly back to where they were when the crisis hit a decade ago. There are probably two ways of looking at this. One way is that this constitutes a remarkable recovery, given that the depth and the length of Ireland's collapse in the Great Recession was greater than for any other economy. The other way of looking at this is that this constitutes a lost decade. But in closing, let me draw attention to two of the important ways that Ireland 2018 differs from Ireland 2008. First, output and employment and the economy generally are much better balanced now than they were a decade ago. The size of the banking sector has reduced considerably. The current account is now in surplus. Credit conditions remain stable, while fiscal policy is also no longer reliant on construction sector revenues. Second, there is now currently a clear policy stance with widespread public and political buy-in, which is critical, and this is now enshrined mainly in domestic legislation as well as European legislation. And this is a clear policy stance to mitigate economic risks by building resilience and medium-term stability into fiscal and macroprudential policies over the medium term. So let me finish here. Um, the circumstances over the past eight years have of course been quite different in Ireland compared to Greece reflecting partly, I think, different structures of our economy. Hopefully some of this experience is relevant for your discussions during the remainder of the day, and um, I look forward to elaborating on any as necessary during the panel or at um, some of the breaks. Thank you.